Well met by moonlight, dear ones. I am Curiosity, and this is my jamboree. A firelit gathering for explorers of the uncanny, the frightening, and the hard to explain. Tonight, we spin the tale of good dogs, sinister theme park visitors, and tragedies that may not have happened. Parallel universes, alternate realities, science tells us they're very possible. But can we visit them? Can we slip into them accidentally? Can some part of our minds perceive them? The three stories I'm reading today certainly give us pause for thought. So settle in by the crackling fire, lean in close, try to remember the words to Kumbaya, and let's begin. Uh, be warned, dear ones, today's stories do deal with some pretty heavy topics. See the description for specific warnings, and stay safe out there. Our first story is from r slash glitch in the matrix and was posted by user Chef Fuzzy. I've never ever told this story to anyone, but I've kept it in my mind since it happened in 1998. I just want to preface by saying I've never held a belief in ghosts or an afterlife or anything of the sort. Even this event is not enough to make me believe ghosts are real. However, I do not have any material explanation for the event. It was mid-August, 1998. I was 22 years old and working a summer job at a gas station before heading back to school. I'd started college late as I fumbled about for a year or two after high school. Anyways, on a nice warm summer night, cars would come and go, and we had a full-service pump. I'd walk out of my little storefront for every car and pump their gas. The weather was perfect not too hot when normally it would be blisteringly hot that time of year. Around the side of the building were the entrances to the bathrooms. I headed that way to use the restroom when I saw two hippie-looking teens with a dog, a boy and a girl. I grew up listening to bands like The Grateful Dead and Fish, still do, and while I don't present as a hippie, I feel very comfortable in those circles. I could tell these kids had probably been hitchhiking. They didn't look destitute, but they were dirty and probably a bit hungry. Even though I was probably no more than five years older than them, I felt bad and wanted to help. I put a few bucks in the vending machine, bought them some snacks and drinks, and gave the dog a bowl of water. They were very thankful, and the doggo was friendly. We chatted for a minute, then the boy said, The dog's not ours. He was just hanging out here. He was friendly, so we just started playing and patting him. That was strange, of course, but not too crazy, right? Dogs get lost all the time. He was friendly and didn't look mistreated, so I just assumed he'd gotten lost. Oh, and he had a collar and tag. Cool, I can find his owner. Oh, and his name? Sam. Important to note that he would respond to me calling his name. Sam. A car pulled up to the full-service pump, so I ran out and did my thing. Last I looked, the hippies and Sam were still hanging out this time, sort of off to the side of the store near where I first saw them. I finished up with the car, and turned round to head back to the storefront. No hippies anywhere in sight. Nowhere. Just gone. Perhaps they hitched a ride while I was turned round, but it was only a minute. When I walked out to the street, I could see quite a way in both directions, but they were nowhere to be seen. This is the last I saw of the two hippie kids. I hope they're okay. Sam was still there, but it was getting late. I wanted to help. I decided to call the local police who gave me the phone number of the animal shelter. I called over there and the way it was handled seemed very odd at the time and still does, but I wanted to help so I went along with it. Sam was a good boy after all. The person I spoke with at animal control looked up Sam's info based on the dog tag numbers. This person, instead of contacting the owner or telling me to wait for an officer, gave me Sam's owner's phone number and told me to call. I called the number and an older man politely answered the phone. I explained I had Sam, I gave him water and he's just hanging out with me here. But the gas station is closing soon, so it'd be best for you to come pick up Sam. He seemed perplexed and asked me to describe Sam to him. I did. Sam looked like a mutt lab mix, darkish brown coat, medium large sized dog, very friendly disposition. Just a regular old good boy. What the man said next has been rattling round in my brain for the last 24 years. The man said, well, We had a dog named Sam, 
but he passed away a good ten years ago. I was dumbfounded. All I could do was describe Sam again, to which the man said, Yeah, that sounds like Sam, but no way it could be. It just can't be. He was polite, and we talked back and forth a bit more, but with no resolution, we hung up. I was unsure about what to do next, but I quickly realized there was nothing for me to do. Just like the hippie kids, Sam too was nowhere to be seen. He just vanished. I would give anything to have this make sense. To be able to actually resolve this in a way that makes sense, I've never been able to. OP has added that he'd love to hear people's explanations for what he experienced. There's a link to the original Reddit post in the description, so if you think you have an idea, why not let him know? Our second story is from r slash glitch in the matrix, and was posted by user exileme. In 2012, when I was 16 years old, me and my six friends went to Thorpe Park, a theme park here in the UK. The new ride, The Swarm, had just opened, so of course we were going to go straight there. We queued for about 45 minutes before being sent to the stands. I have no idea what these are called, the things you stand between, waiting for the next carriage to arrive. On the second row of about twelve rows, the carriage ahead had just been loaded, and a very large dude, probably at least six foot seven, was placed in his seat. As the ride was about to go, an attendant came over and told the guy he was too big to ride, and he had to go wait outside for his party to finish the ride. Now this guy, like I said, was absolutely huge. Big afro and basically incredibly memorable. Anyway, after we'd been on the ride, I again remember seeing him outside with his friends. They were loudly taking the piss out of him for not being allowed on, basically. Fast forward about 14 months, and we went to Thorpe Park again. I believe it was more or less the same group of friends I went with before maybe give or take one or two people. Again, we of course went on swarm. We waited around 45 minutes again, and were sent to the same stands, again, second from the front, with my same three friends who came on my row the last time. As the ride was about to leave, an attendant came over and told a certain gentleman he was too big to ride. As I looked over, it was the exact same person as before. I know for an absolute fact that this six foot seven, humongous man was the same person. I remembered him distinctly. Everything was the same. The way he climbed out of the chair, walked off and went outside. The only thing I don't remember is whether or not it was the same attendant, as I was honestly so flabbergasted by what I was seeing. I turned to my friends and said, what the f- that's the same guy from last time, in the exact same situation as last time. Nobody paid much attention to me, but sort of acknowledged it. Maybe nobody remembered the time before like I did. I kept going on about it for a good few minutes, but nobody seemed to listen or care. By the time we got off the ride, this time, he wasn't waiting with his friends. One of the things that I always found odd about this is the fact I never remembered seeing this guy in line, both of the times I went. 45 minute waits each time, and I never once noticed this guy standing where he should have been, like 30 people ahead of me. And trust me, the huge afro, 6 foot 7, he would have been easily noticed. Since then, I've mentioned it maybe twice to my friends who were there, and they all look at me like I was crazy, or I vaguely remember something, probably just wanting me to stop talking. I understand this may not be an exciting story for some. I'm just hoping somebody could have experienced something similar. My own assessment is it really was just the biggest coincidence, and it just so happened. Myself and this guy ended up going to the theme park on the same days, on the same ride, at the exact same time, in the exact same situation as 14 months previous. But that's near impossible, right? It certainly sounds unlikely. Thanks for sharing. Our final story was sent in by a viewer called Simon J. This one gets a bit heavy, so please proceed with caution. 
In my last year of uni, so I was 21, my girlfriend of two years told me she was pregnant. We hadn't been careless, but as anyone will tell you, accidents happen. If it had happened in the earlier stage of our relationship, I don't know if she would have kept it. We would have been in the middle of studying, our relationship would have been too new, and we weren't in any position in our lives to face that kind of thing. Strange the difference two years could make. In that time, I'd already proposed. We were planning on moving to another city together after uni, and she already had a job lined up. She'd taken a degree in aerospace engineering. I don't know precisely what that entailed, a humanities student over here, but her degree program included bursaries from huge companies for the top students, and she was one. So she had a job lined up on the condition that she graduate with a first, which everyone knew she would. And indeed, she did. You'll notice that I haven't used a name for her, fake or otherwise. Well, that's because I know you're supposed to use fake names in stories like this, but I can't face doing that to her, so she'll just have to stay. Her. Things were looking up for us. I didn't have anything lined up, but the plan we'd made was that while she spent a few years with this company, I'd work to help save up for the baby, and then when things were settled, I'd continue my education. To get anywhere in my field, you need a PhD, though I wasn't in a rush, especially since we now had some pretty strong priorities looming. Something about my girlfriend that will come up later is that she had a favorite color. A really favorite color. Like how that woman in Breaking Bad has everything in purple. In my girlfriend's case, it was this bright bluish green. I don't even know the name of it, but everything she had was this color. Even her car at the time was a second-hand Nissan Micra, the old kind, the kind that was actually tiny, that she'd been overjoyed to find already in this colour. About halfway through the pregnancy, we got a puppy. The idea, and it was hers, was that the baby would have a best friend to grow up with, but we wouldn't have to house train a puppy at the same time as being completely frazzled, looking after a newborn. We found a beautiful German Shepherd, and don't worry, not from a puppy mill. There was an older couple my parents knew whose dog had recently had a litter, free to a good home, etc. We called the puppy Bailey, because it was one of those German shepherds with the light brown coffee-coloured fur, and I joked that it looked like a Bailey's, a coffee liqueur for those wondering. My girlfriend got into the habit of calling him Bailey Boo. Jesus, typing that out was so hard. It felt so personal and it was like a knife in my chest. You can't tell because this is one long bit of text, but I had a good long cry after writing that last part. A couple of months later, my life changed forever. There'd been an accident on the road and my girlfriend was killed in a collision. She was eight months pregnant. Bailey lived through it, but was so badly injured that he had to be put down within a day or so of it happening. There was no one to blame. The police looked at the scene and there was no other vehicle involved. She'd just run off the road for whatever reason, and happened to hit a huge tree, in the wrong way, at the wrong speed. The police sergeant called it bad luck. I was staying with my parents at the time it happened, and they drove me back. I got to the hospital and I was about to go see her in the morgue, but my dad stopped me. He didn't block my way or anything, but he stood in front of me and looked me in the eyes and asked me if I really wanted to see her like this. He'd been very composed ever since finding out the news, the long car ride. My parents loved her, but he's always been that stoic dad type. But in that moment, when he looked me dead in the eyes, I don't know, but his composure broke. He was in tears as he asked me, and I realized he was right. I know some people would have wanted that closure, but to me, I don't know. I don't think I could have faced it. Maybe I could, but we'll never know. My whole life felt like it had ended, too. The day before she died, I was a husband-to-be, a father-to-be. I had a plan for my life that revolved around both of those things, and I wasn't looking at saying goodbye to that dog until my kid was a teenager. And I was so angry about what had happened to her. Not at anyone or anything, but just angry at life. The idea that she can have done so well and have a plan, 
and all of these things promised to her, and it just gets taken away. The raw emotion of it has faded, but I still feel that deep in my heart, the anger of it all. The idea that life and all things in it are so meaningful except to the universe. I know it sounds stupid, but I really felt like she should have mattered to the universe as much as she mattered to me. I had a lot of support around me, including from her parents, who I'm still in touch with, though it's down to Christmas and birthday cards and the odd phone call. That's how life goes. When their daughter's savings came into their ownership, she was an only child and didn't have a will because she was in her twenties. They spoke quietly with my parents and had it all ultimately given to me. They didn't have to do that, and I hadn't been expecting it. They're good people, and I wish their only kid hadn't been taken away from them. The world needs more people raised by parents like that. I stayed with my parents for a year or so. I felt like I'd regressed so much, none of my plans meant anything to me anymore. I worked, because even in grief I felt guilty about not contributing to the household, though my parents barely took anything from me to cover food and bills. So when I was finally ready to move out, I had a good bit saved. Life went on. I've had a couple of girlfriends since then, but nothing that lasted more than a few months. Nothing wrong with them, but the truth is I've been left with a lot of commitment issues. Now I'm pretty upfront with anyone I date that it's probably only going to be a casual thing. No point being dishonest. I guess deep down I hope I'll meet someone who makes me feel something like she made me feel. This next part of the story took place pretty recently just coming up to ten years since she, our dog and our unborn child, died. I was walking through a local park, clearing my head, when I hear something that grabs me. You know how you forget things about people you're close to, even if you're still close? Well, there's plenty of things I've forgotten about that relationship. All the little details are completely obscured by the tragic way it came to an end. Anyway, I hear a voice not far away from me say something that sounded close enough to Bailey Boo to grab my attention. I turned round, and there was the glitch in the Matrix. I saw a woman walking with a kid, maybe about ten years old, and a German shepherd, the sort with grey-brown fur. She looked just like my girlfriend, but older. The really weird thing was that the reason she was calling her dog was that it had bounded up to me. She was apologizing, but I was cool. I love dogs, and I asked if I could give him a fuss. She said yes, and I did, and I noticed his metallic blue-green collar. She said to me in a voice so like my girlfriend's I could have cried that he's not normally this friendly, but there must be something about me that he likes. I know that it's a common enough breed of dog, and I guess a common enough coloring. Of course, I only ever knew our Bailey as a puppy, so I could never say the two dogs were near identical. I kept fussing the dog and chatting with the woman. Actually, I sort of picked up a vibe from her, although I actually found it hard to look at her for too long. The similarities to my girlfriend were too much. After a couple of minutes, I stood up and said something like, Well, better let you get on. See you around. She smiled and my heart fell out of my chest. That was my girlfriend's smile. They could have been sisters. They could have been twins. Her mouth was the same shape, the way her eyes creased. She smiled and led her baby and dog away. I turned and walked about three steps, then for some reason, I felt like I f***ed up by not talking to or even really looking at the kid. By now I was entirely in my head about it, that maybe if I saw the kid I'd see what my kid would have looked like. I turned around as casually as I could, knowing that running into them again might be creepy or coming on too strong. Desperately trying to think of something to say like, do you live around here? But everything I came up with in that couple of seconds was far too desperate sounding. I'd have loved to run into her again, but it seemed a bit much to try and make it happen. She was gone, not around a corner. The view was completely clear. There was no way for the three of them to have suddenly dashed behind something. I walked further in that direction, looking everywhere, but they were gone. It was a good thing I had sunglasses on, because as I walked back to my house I was crying. I don't know. Even now, months later, whether I was crying out of grief, joy, or some weird mix of the two, 
I know the likely explanation is that this woman looked kind of similar to my girlfriend, and a decade has weakened my memory of what she really looked like. But that smile, the dog, the specific colour of his collar, I'm not going to read too much into it. I know more than most that life's too short to go down weird supernatural rabbit holes. I'll keep going to the park, in the hopes of seeing them again, but my intuition is that I won't. Whatever this glitch in the Matrix really was, it's left me with the feeling that, although this universe didn't let it happen, there's one out there where she's happy. I think I can live with that. Thank you so much for sharing that story, Simon. I had to stop recording a few times because it really affected me. I'm so sorry for your loss, but I'm glad you found a way to make peace with it. The sun is rising, and the birds are chirping from the hedgerows. The jamboree is at an end once more. My thanks to everyone who sent in stories or let me narrate theirs. Remember, I upload new stories on Mondays and Fridays, so be sure to subscribe and click that bell icon so you don't miss out. If you have any thoughts about the stories I've narrated, why not leave them in the comments below? And don't forget, if you enjoyed your time by the fireside, to wind the like button around a lure and plop it into the river to see what you catch for breakfast. If you'd like a story of yours narrated, I have a submission form linked in the description, and I would love to learn more of your curious experiences and unexplained happenings. I will see you soon, dear ones, and until then, may your nights be dark and your dreams just a little curious. <laughs>